When Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1932, the skilled blue-collar productive labor force had been forgotten. In the descent into decadence and corruption, our nation's presidents had brought us further away from the American system and closer to the system of our long-standing enemy. When Roosevelt dedicated himself to defending the forgotten man, he knew he was preserving the indispensable pillars of our nation from a backwards culture of empire which had come to dominate our population's daily lives. The British Empire took great satisfaction in its policies, which had induced the United States to destroy itself. With the U.S. in ruins, the British system saw even further opportunities to exploit America in order to preserve its rotting empire. Any true American, however, saw this as an attack on his culture because the creative potential of America's citizens was being strangled. The uplifting of the forgotten men and women have always been key to our strength as a nation. It was these plain people who settled the West under excruciatingly difficult conditions, who ignited the forges that kept our arsenal stocked during the Revolution, or laid the spikes in the railroad which united the Atlantic to the Pacific. It was these forgotten men and women who embodied the true culture of the United States, one never before seen in the history of man, and one diametrically opposed to the culture of empire which dominated Europe. They, led by some of the greatest leaders the world has seen, had the courage to conquer the challenges of humanity. Even when our nation has become sleepy, backwards, Far from the intent of those settlers who crossed the Atlantic centuries before, our unique culture has been revived and developed in order to carry out a mission above the lives of individuals. These words of Roosevelt have deep roots and were not only what sparked the mass mobilization which won a world war, it was a historic fight against a system of empire. When settlers came to inhabit a new continent on the other side of the Atlantic, they were ready to build up a new republic. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, led by John Winthrop, had been the first to take on this historic mission. What was before them was a landmass unique in potential that had not existed anywhere in Europe. If it were to be developed and organized around a new idea of mankind, it would be necessary to defeat the control of an oligarchy. Competing powers had dominion over these colonies, but what they all had in common was that none of them supported inland development for fear of the possibility of a new world republic. By the beginning of the 18th century, over a hundred years since European settlers had first reached the shores of North America, the interior of the continent was still an untamed wilderness. What remained untapped was the mighty potential of North America's system of lakes and waterways. The Mississippi River connected 3,902 miles of the continent from north to south, one of the longest rivers in the world. Far from its banks were the population centers along the eastern coast of North America, largely blocked in, due to a policy of maintaining the colonies as weak and dependent. If the links were established from the eastern settlements all the way to the Mississippi, the full integration of the continent would be established. One of those most convenient links existed in the Ohio River. The Ohio, whose source was just a short trip from the head springs of the Potomac, would for the first time bring a continent together as one integrated functioning organism, speeding up the economic time of the country. North America had an abundance of resources waiting to be uncovered, but who would utilize them if they were stuck thousands of miles away in a treacherous wilderness? Who would even produce the technology to expand their usefulness if the policy of England was one of keeping her colonies confined to their coastal boundaries? 
I declare my opinion to be that all these colonies, which are but twigs belonging to the main tree, ought to be kept entirely dependent upon and subservient to England. And that can never be if they are suffered to go on in the notions they have that as they are Englishmen, so they may set up the same manufacturers here as people may do in England. For the consequence will be that if once they can see they can clothe themselves, not only comfortably but handsomely too, without the help of England, they, who are already not very fond of submitting to government, would soon think of putting into execution designs they had long harbored in their breasts. This will not seem strange when you consider what sort of people this country is inhabited by. This attitude of subjugation of its colonies had greatly succeeded in Virginia. It was one of the most backwards colonies at the time. The growth of its slave population vastly exceeded its free population, and there were no cities to speak of, hardly any towns, and no education for children except for the sons of wealthy planters. Virginia's territory extended from the coast to the Mississippi River, down to Kentucky, as far north as what would be later called Michigan and Minnesota, and over to Pennsylvania's western border. With its expansive territory, which included the large rivers and great lakes of the continent, Virginia was a key flank against imperial schemes for maintaining the colonies as but twigs. By 1710, the independent Republican base of Massachusetts had been crushed, but a new Republican offensive was launched to restore the mission of creating American Continental Republic. This offensive, led by Republican circles of Gottfried Leibniz ally Jonathan Swift, began to reorient the Queen Anne government of England towards Republican aspirations. Bold new moves were made to open the way for Western expansion. One such plan was to seize Canada and the Great Lakes from the French, opening up Western New York for permanent settlement and linking the Mid-Atlantic to the vast territories beyond the Appalachian Mountains. The appointment of two new royal governors, closely allied to Queen Anne in England, expedited this process. One of these governors was Alexander Spotswood. At age 33, Spotswood already had 16 years of military experience under his belt, earning the permanent title of colonel. He was a true pioneer, playing a crucial role in opening up the continent to development, breaking the oligarchic grip over Virginia's territory, and keeping the drive for the American Republic alive. Spotswood wasted no time in attacking one of the most backwards policies of Virginia, the oligarchical system of land tenure. Not only was the population hemmed in along a 50-mile coastal region, but huge tracts of western land were bought up by Virginia's elite and left as wilderness. This prevented the average settler from buying a family farm and extending the colony's cultivated lands to the mountains and beyond. Spotswood took action against this policy. To the end that the industrious poor of this colony, and others who shall come to dwell here, may not want land whereon to employ their industry, whilst others possess more than they are able to cultivate. Spotswood traveled all throughout Virginia, exploring its waterways and looking for new locations to set up forts and towns. Virginia's first postal system was established under his governorship, and a functioning militia was organized for the colony's protection. But one of the most significant advancements that would support this entire process was the establishment of an iron industry. He sent recruiters to Europe to offer free land to any skilled German iron makers who would emigrate to Virginia. Although the new iron works were built in the wilderness, they were designed according to the most advanced technology of the time and experiments conducted at two of the iron furnaces advanced the smelting process even further. Spotswood's efforts resulted in a network of iron foundries that eventually provided an iron backbone to support the American Revolution. But the Virginia toadies of the Crown struck back at the threat of development and provoked the Indians to attack the interior settlements. Spotswood was prepared to defend Virginia against such threat 
but also had a plan of action towards a lasting peace. He generated treaty agreements among several of the tribes and began to develop the infrastructure to educate the children of the Indian tribe leaders. It was such a success that soon more students were sent to be educated than could be provided for. Spotswood's mission was to break the financial and political control over the colony, create a type of citizenry that would be committed to developing Virginia's vast potential, generate real industrial and agricultural production, establish a functioning militia and system of defense, and push the frontiers of settlement all the way to the Mississippi. This mission drove Spotswood to push the limits of what was commonly thought of as feasible in 1716 by leading a group of men along a route through the Blue Ridge Mountains and into the Shenandoah Valley. But his intent was not just to reach the Shenandoah. As he informed the hostile Board of Trade in London, The chief aim of my expedition over the Great Mountains in 1716 was to satisfy myself whether it was practicable to come at the Great Lakes. Having on that occasion found an easy passage over the Great Ridge of Mountains, which before were judged unpassable, I also discovered, by relation of Indians who frequent those parts, that from the pass where I was, it is but three days' march to a great nation of Indians living on a river which discharges itself into Lake Erie. But as Spotswood and his allies fought for a republic, others in the seats of power at Williamsburg were committed to a culture of empire. Queen Anne supported the push for inland development, but upon her death, and with the accession of George I to the throne, Spotswood's mission became vulnerable. The French began to accelerate their military encirclement of the British colonies, which were seen by the British Empire as merely military choke points against America's westward expansion. The empire's chief source of control was in its maritime capability, not in its inland development, which would force it to develop its own population. Any expansion inland would challenge the empire's control of the colony. If Spotswood's plan was to succeed in settling the West and establishing peace, Britain would lose its ability to maintain the colonies as plantations of the empire. As a result, Spotswood and his allies were forced out of power in 1722. With Spotswood out of office, the pass over the Blue Ridge Mountains could not be sustained for development. That mission, nearly lost, was rescued by a new conspiracy launched in the 1740s. A British lord, Thomas Fairfax VI, acquired a proprietorship extending from the Chesapeake to the headwaters of the Potomac. Not only did it contain an abundance of western land, but the furthest extent of what would later be turned into America's first development corridor along the Potomac River. Fairfax, who supported the creation of an American republic, joined with the circle of Virginia Republicans who had been allied with Spotswood. They began settlements in the Ohio River Valley, calling themselves the Ohio Company. The Ohio Company began to set up the trading posts, settlements, and forts needed to develop Virginia's vast interior. The British Empire was then faced with a trap, either to support the American drive for expansion or be seen as abandoning and setting fire to its own colonies, sparking the drive towards separation. The chief collaborators in the Ohio Company were a family which had long been known to Spotswood. The youngest member of this family, at age 16, became the most instrumental person in the fight to secure Spotswood's original mission. This young man would end up defending this policy even until the day he died. His name was George Washington. Washington? whose steadfast leadership would become instrumental on the battlefields of the American Revolution, was well aware of the fight for a republic that had been underway before his lifetime. He and his collaborators continued Spotswood's mission to fight for the development of the interior 
and protect and develop the forgotten men and women of this continent. With the establishment of an American constitution, the commitment to this development could not be removed. As long as there would exist a citizenry to preserve this fight, the principle of the U.S. Constitution would remain. With a new nation secure, America's leaders went to work unifying the United States for a lasting peace. Washington, before he became president and after he retired from the army, began to work towards the development of a canal system that would finally break the grip the empire had over the population for nearly two centuries. The western settlers stand as it were upon a pivot. The touch of a feather would turn them any way. Smooth the road and make easy the way for them, and then see what an influx of articles will be poured upon us, how amazingly our exports will be increased by them, and how amply we shall be compensated for any trouble and expense we may encounter to effect it. In 1825, the Erie Canal officially connected the Hudson River to the Great Lakes. The Potomac Canal brought in ships from the Chesapeake Bay to within 100 miles of the Ohio River. Throughout the next 75 years, the United States would grow not just in landmass, but in infrastructural development on a scale never before seen in history. But the most important was the development of the minds of the citizenry. The 19th century in the United States saw an explosion in cultural and creative activity and secured the United States as a beacon of hope and a temple of liberty for all mankind. By the dawn of the 20th century, what had once been part of the vast territory of Virginia was fully developed in terms of transportation and infrastructure, with trains, canals, lock systems and roads facilitating the transport of goods and raw materials, with new cities and communities into which productive workers flooded, allowing this area of the country to become the strongest and most productive industrial region of the world.
Meanwhile, the British Empire was still raging full steam ahead toward destruction of nations. In the aftermath of the assassination of America's great patriotic statesman, William McKinley, successive U.S. presidents submitted to the will of an empire system, leaving the fight for the American system behind. A speculative economy and the corruption of American culture led our nation to a depression which brought the productive motor of America to a grinding halt in the 1920s. However, throughout such suffering or even loss of consciousness of what America represented, a spirit still existed which only needed to be reawakened. A nation, like a person, has something deeper, something more permanent, something larger than the sum of all its parts. It is that something which matters most to its future, which calls forth the most sacred guarding of its present. It is a thing for which we find it difficult, even impossible, to hit upon a single, simple word. And yet, yet we all understand what it is, the spirit, the faith of America. It is the product of centuries. It was born in the multitudes of those who came from many lands, some of high degree, but mostly plain people who sought here early and late to find freedom more freely. If you and I, if we in this later day lose that sacred fire, if we let it be smothered with doubt and fear, then we shall reject the destiny which Washington strove so valiantly and so triumphantly to establish. The preservation of the spirit and faith of the nation does and will furnish the highest justification for every sacrifice that we may make in the cause of national defense. For this, for this we muster the spirit of America and the faith of America. We do not retreat. We are not content to stand still. As Americans, we go forward in the service of our country by the will of God. Roosevelt restored the earlier development of the nation and expanded it, picking up our republic's historic mission in order to further unite the country and bring forth the creative capability of each citizen. Under Roosevelt's policies, no area of the country saw a greater concentration of production than the Midwest region and its rivers and Great Lakes. This magnificent natural setting for human development was improved by a network grid of ports, railroads, and infrastructure near to factories, homes, and community facilities. Materials were brought in from the mines and processed in the steel mills of western Pennsylvania and Ohio and quickly brought into production in cities along the rivers, most especially Detroit. Detroit had an astounding 30 rail lines, with 534 miles of rail inside the city itself. The incomparable development of the productive powers of labor among American citizens, the incredible industrial strength, which had grown out of 200 years of development of this productive region of the country and the people, made the Ohio River Valley and the surrounding Midwest the indispensable factor in the coming challenge that the world would face. 
Great Britain became an ally of the United States during World War II, but the relationship was not one of old enemies reconciling their differences. The British Empire had provided extensive funding and diplomatic support to the Nazi Party, but now it saw before itself a new trap. The empire's geopolitical aims of weakening Russia received a shock when Hitler began to attack westward, throwing Britain into a unique relationship with the United States. If Britain's empire were to survive, it would have to abandon its puppet Hitler and ally itself with the very United States which it intended to destroy. Rather than adopt the types of techniques that would allow it to outpace Germany in production, Britain stuck to methods suited to its peculiar brand of industrial life. Britain clung to tradition, a method of apprenticeship and building as old as the Middle Ages. They limited their production to a skilled elite that would produce through specialized departments rather than the more effective assembly line methods that built an entire plane from the ground up in one factory. Although Britain adapted the system to its requirements, it was inefficient in that it would take several years to get the system running at optimal level. All the workers were new at their jobs, so it was unknown how long it would take for them to accomplish their individual tasks, making it impossible to coordinate something as simple as shipping. This created the situation where Britain would find itself with hundreds of engines and no fuselages. Then there was the danger of an air raid attack, which would tie up the entire process even more. The difference in outlook between Britain and America was evident, where the American outlook was one of employing every individual, no matter what level of skill or gender. The British outlook had a problem with opening our industry to allow unskilled men to do skilled men's work, since they hated to see their skilled labor diluted by men who were unskilled. Where Rolls-Royce produced single cars by hand of high craftsmanship, Ford could pump out its cars by the thousands in a highly developed process. This was the method that was converted to war production and was essential in coming to the aid of Great Britain. Britain, on its hands and knees, reluctantly realized that they needed the American industrial might to win the war, although its view of the post-war world was contrary to that of Roosevelt and could not coexist with the American system. Even before the United States officially entered the war, Roosevelt mobilized the productive centers of the U.S. to think of winning the war on the assembly lines, calling for the production of 50,000 military aircraft in one year. All of Detroit's heavy industry, the majority of which had become concentrated into auto, was channeled into military production. For three years, tanks, jeeps, and bombers rolled off the assembly lines instead of commercial automobiles. New factories were built from the ground up. Detroit, which had become the most important of the industrial cities in the Midwest, became the focal point for what came to be called the Arsenal of Democracy. With Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States population were mobilized, as if called upon by their ancestors to protect that republic they had fought for and sacrificed so much to create and maintain. Men lined up that very day to enlist in the war. Women filled their places on the assembly line floor. Teachers, waitresses, housewives, actresses, all worked the line, running machine tools, riveting, assembling, and inspecting planes. 350,000 workers went to Detroit in just the first 18 months following America's entry into the war to work in the emergency defense industry. Enthusiastically, these skilled blue-collar workers leapt to the challenge and engaged aggressively in a mission not only to win a war against fascism, but to defend that American spirit which we had fought for for the past 300 years.
as quickly as a mission is brought into existence, it can also be extinguished. Here we are, where this mission has been put out of the memory of too many Americans. Once again, our most valuable individuals in society have been cast aside. There is no potential lacking in our nation's people. We are not blocked in by our steep mountain ranges. We are not limited in the technology we can produce or even bound to the planet we live on. Building a canal or a rail system at one time seemed like no challenge to a nation like ours, but we no longer even have the commitment to maintain what we've already built. Once again, the United States has been induced to destroy itself by the hand of the British Empire, and our nation has deteriorated morally as much as economically. The American people must do more than protest. They must know this historic fight and live in it. There is no mission to be taken up different from that which drove our settlers to found a new republic. It is innate in our culture. Today, we see the majority of the world suppressed by an imperial system. Our mission must incorporate the world as a whole in a fight for its survival. We are the nation that can exert its sovereignty. Other nations, ready to partake in breaking the grip of the British system, will follow. All true Americans today will call for moves as bold as that taken by John Winthrop in 1630. These plans, already begun by our great American statesmen, must be taken to the next level and will include the forgotten men and women of the world. Even though our nation has become sleepy, backwards, far from the intent of those settlers who crossed the Atlantic centuries before, that spirit, which drove individuals to achieve the impossible, still exists in the American people. But the course of action is still theirs to take. <laughs>